Welcome to another exciting episode of Call Me the Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Call Me the Divine. Call Me the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. But before I do so, I thought it would be a great idea to introduce the basic concept of Buddhism and the history of Buddhism so that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch at the maximum value. So today, we're going to be talking about something super exciting. We're going to be talking about the, the tea. Uh, we're going to be talking about the channel. And we're going to be talking about the channel in relationship with uh, Buddhism. So, but you know, I have no idea where to even begin. People expect I'm a Japanese and, uh, you know, people expect that I know everything about Japan, which is not true. So I invited somebody who can talk about the channel uh, like no other people can. I would love to introduce to you uh, Omar uh, Francis Sensei. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. I know you are super famous in your community, but just in case for the people who don't know anything about you, please introduce yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Omar Francis. I live in the United States, very near Chicago, Illinois. And uh, I've been studying tea for 25 years now. I'm a student continuously for 15 years and I've been teaching for the last 10. Um, of course, you always keep studying. So I still have a teacher, I still study. And um, even though I've been studying for this amount of time, I'm really considered young. So many people have been teaching and studying for 50 years or 60 years. So I'm still starting out in many ways. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, now we would love to ask you this fundamental question. Uh, what is channel? Ah, yes, what is Chado? Um, it's hard for me to say because when I start talking about it, I can't stop. So I don't know if saying too much or too little. So we'll just see what happens. Um, I think Chado often is called the Japanese way of tea. It's the way of people getting together, focusing on this one moment in time through the act of making tea. Um, it's matcha. So matcha has a certain way to be made. It's not in tiny cups, but it's in bowls. Um, you're using certain sources of water. You're using certain implements. And it's not really just the enjoyment of the tea itself, but enjoyment of everything that comes together to make the tea. The ceramics, the lacquer work, the metal work, the calligraphy, um, all these things are part of tea. So the beautiful thing about it is that it really it really makes all these different things come alive. You know, if you have a scroll and you put it on the wall and then you're like, oh, well, that's it. Well, in tea, you talk about it, you look at it, you, 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 it sets the theme. You have these beautiful dishes, but they're just sitting on a shelf. In tea, you put it out. You know, things that would be normally in a museum, that's what we use for tea, if, if you're that lucky. You know, so these things aren't looked at between pieces of glass and from a distance, these are touched and held in your hands. And there's just some kind of beautiful connection you get with people and objects through making tea. Mm. So what are some of the practices of chattel? Sure, sure. Well, often it's called the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, and maybe that's the best way to describe it in English. Uh, it seems like it looks like a very uh, ritualized gathering. You know, where people are very stern and very serious and like something very important is going on. But really at the heart of it is that someone who's the host really wants to share with someone else the guest. And so they try to take all the steps they can to make this a beautiful moment in time. Mm -hmm. So I've heard of uh, the word channel you. Uh, you know, it's so confusing. There's a channel you and the channel and the people use use them interchangeably. So can you tell us some of the differences between these words? Sure, sure. Um, there's so many words that go around. And I think I find myself just saying tea. Just most of the time I just say tea. I'm gonna go to tea class or I'm gonna go to a tea gathering. But often in Japanese, you hear the term channel you or chado 
or even Sado. I think what it is, is that if you go back in time, a lot of the Japanese arts um, didn't claim to be necessarily a big spiritual endeavor, that they were a cultural thing, that they were um, a sign of refinement, a sign of um, skill and dignity. And so when you were doing, let's say, a tea gathering, you were doing cha no yu. It simply means cha is tea, no is possessive, and yu means hot water. So it means hot water for tea, because truly you can't drink tea. Tea is a plant. So you drink the hot water of tea, and that's channel you. Well, just like many of the other arts, they started out as a very practical thing, a skill that you do, um, folding paper, placing flowers, things like that. And even the martial arts didn't make a big claim to be like a spiritual endeavor. You learn swordsmanship so you can survive. And the, the, the reward for being a, a skilled swordsman is that you're not dead. But in time, this idea of a spiritual element really came into most of Japanese culture, it seems. And so placing flowers can be a spiritual path. Um, doing calligraphy can be a spiritual path. Um, using a sword, even though you don't actually kill someone, can be a spiritual path. And then also making tea can be a spiritual path. So if you put your whole heart into it, it's not just cha no yu anymore, like a pastime, it's cha do. It's the way that you can move forward and I won't say enlighten yourself, but you can improve yourself or at least understand yourself. Um, cha no yu, or sorry, cha do is unique in one sense that you always have to have someone else. Um, there's always a host and there's always a guest. So it's really about relationships and how you can connect to other people. We use tea as a way to do it. I'm sure people can do it in other ways too. You know, baseball or uh, movies or, you know, watching cars racing by or loving trains, but we love tea. And so by putting our whole heart into tea and all that goes along with it, hopefully then we move into something that's more like chado. The reason why you have chado and sado is that sometimes the word for tea is pronounced sa, like kisaten. Um, so a lot of people say sado. I think many people of my tradition, the Urasinke tradition, we say chado. So sometimes you hear it both ways in Japan, but it's the same thing. Chano yu, chado, sado. A again, I think chano yu emphasizes the actual doing of tea, but chado is the whole spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Very, very fascinating. So yes, like uh, when I see uh, chado uh, going on, so I always see people wearing kimono and it looks very formal. And uh, today I can see you wearing kimono and you know, do we always have to wear kimono to do chado? Well, that's a very good question. And honestly, sometimes I go back and forth. Um, chado, or channel you or T, and excuse me if I use terms all over the place today, but when you're going to a tea gathering, the kimono really is the most appropriate thing. The movements and everything's kind of explained because you're wearing a kimono, the way you sit, the way you stand, the, may, the way you move across a room, it's all dictated on how your body moves when you're wearing a kimono. And it is the traditional thing to wear. But honestly, most of the time I don't wear kimono. I don't necessarily wear kimono when I teach. I don't necessarily wear kimono when I'm doing a presentation to the public because the more and more I think about it, uh, which is obvious to you, uh, I'm not Japanese. And so sometimes then when I wear kimono, people see me in a kimono as if it's something that instantly gives me credibility. And sometimes I think that's a problem because you should judge me by what I do, not by what I wear. You know, so just because I'm wearing a kimono, people might assume, oh, wow, he, he really knows something, you know, and I feel that's not, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be there also to entertain someone. Uh, Channel U is not entertainment, you know, so I don't want to put on a costume and, and just live up to other people's expectations. Um, but really, really, the biggest reason why I don't wear kimono sometimes is that at the heart of it, you're trying to make a connection with someone else. So if most of the other people in the audience aren't wearing kimono, then I feel the kimono makes a separation between myself and them. 
and they see me in kimono and they listen to what I say, but they feel like, well, he can do it because he's in kimono, but I don't know how to wear kimono and I don't know how to speak Japanese and I don't know how to do this. So tease something for me to watch, but not something for me to do. So when I teach in a suit and tie and the button up shirt and stuff like that and still can do tea, I, I feel that kind of express the idea that this is for everyone. Again, a lot of times this is called the Japanese tea ceremony. So sometimes people think it's only for Japanese, but really it's for everyone. And if you're Japanese or not, we all have to be trained. So sometimes by not wearing a kimono, I think it, it just makes me a little closer to my guest. Um, but of course, sometimes it's always appropriate for me to wear this. If I go to class with my teacher, I will always be in kimono, you know, because that's what she expects and that's what we do there. But if I'm going to a school or a university or um, some kind of museum and I'm doing a presentation, sometimes it works out better to just wear a suit. Mm -hmm. I didn't know a uh, title uh, only for special people who wear kimono. Mm. <laughs> right, right. Well, it, it, it can sometimes look very intimidating, no matter if you're Japanese or not. You know, you see someone doing tea and you're like, oh, there's all these rules and, oh, I don't even have a kimono, so I can't go to a tea gathering. Or, you know, you start to think of all these reasons why you can't do it. So I think it's better to have reasons why we can do it. We can always improve and we can always refine what we do, but there's no reason to not do it now. And so in a little way, by not wearing a kimono all the time, I hope that expressed that idea. Mm. Very fascinating. So yeah, now we want to go more deep into the way of tea. So sure. what is uh, the history of chado? Well, well, I hope I don't go too long here because the history of chado goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, what I often say to people too is that, um, <laughs> again, I'm sorry if I'm going to talk too long here, but tea in itself didn't originate in Japan, but it came from China. And so it came from China hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And when it did come, it really did come with Buddhism. There's always been this connection between Buddhism of some sort and tea. Um, from the Japanese perspective, it was this exotic, important thing. Um, when it first came over, maybe in the sixth century, it wasn't really a green tea. It was kind of like a brick tea, like a solid pressed, black tea that's made into a brick and you would break off a piece and you add hot water and you know maybe onions and other things it would be like a savory chai and it didn't really fit i guess the japanese taste so it kind of came and went over hundreds of years and people knew of it but no one was really into it it wasn't until well it wasn't really until zen buddhism that tea really took off in japan um by the, I think it was the 12th century, there was already established many different sects of Buddhism in Japan. Um, but they were cut, but Japan was cut off from China for a few hundred years for political reasons. And so things kept changing in China that didn't make it way over to Japan. So when things opened up again and monks went to China to see what was going on, to study more, to research more, that's when they came across Zen Buddhism. And so when they were in China studying and then later brought back sutras and texts and you know, implements from the temple and all the rules and stuff, they brought back tea. In fact, there was one particular monk, um, Asai, um, he brought back tea, either plants or seeds. I'm not exactly sure which one, but he brought back tea to Japan and he actually started to grow it in Japan. And so once it started to grow and once people started to have like more of a fresh green tea, that taste was really popular with people. Starting with the monasteries, they would drink the tea actually more as a medicine as anything else. Um, if you can imagine in Zen monasteries, you have hours and hours of meditation. You have all this work to do and you're not really having any kind of stimulant. But then eventually tea came along and it just helped with your meditation. It helped keep you awake and alert. And it maybe it helped you stop drinking alcohol, which was a nice thing to do to drink a bunch of tea instead of a bunch of alcohol. Again, that connection then with Zen Buddhism and tea became common, maybe is the word, 
and different monasteries will give gifts of tea to each other. So eventually then, this tea was something that the monks would do, but it was also something that the patrons of the monasteries would see. So if you're a wealthy Japanese person and you give a lot of money to this temple, for instance, and you're part of different ceremonies, you then develop the taste of tea. It was still kind of a rare thing over time, and then even over hundreds of years, then people started to enjoy tea outside of the monastery, somewhat mimicking the procedures of the monks in the monastery. So you start to get the procedures of tea starting to grow, but you also get these like tea parties where people would have, let's say, one or two bowls of tea and told, oh, this is from this place and this is from Uji and this is from wherever. And then they're given maybe even a hundred bowls of tea that they don't know. And it becomes this game, this big lavish game where you would taste tea and you look at all your scrolls and your vases and your imported things from China. And it became this great, great party. Um, and that was popular for a while, but all the time the monks were still doing their thing. Eventually, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but eventually when the samurai rose to power, maybe this is more in the 15th century, then it became something that they took to also. But instead of showing all of your things, instead of showing everything you own, that you own, and instead of just showing things from China, the idea was like, oh, we can focus on Japanese things. And instead of having a servant come in and bring tea, maybe I should make tea myself. So I'm the Lord of the house and I invite you to my house and I'm gonna make tea for you. I'm gonna serve the meal to you. I'm gonna take care of you so much that I'm not gonna eat or drink myself. And I'm just here to take care of you. And so I focus on a few things and hopefully through this gathering, I can express my heart to you. And we can have this connection just through a bowl of tea. And it goes on and on and on through the Tokugawa period into the Meiji period to the um, industrial area, era of Japan. But it's always been that tea was a way of people coming together. But I should also say too, it's more than just the beverage of the tea. It's always been about the implements, the bowls, the scrolls, the calligraphy, the um, tea architecture, the clothes, the food. You know, it's really that tea makes this moment in time to bring all these different things together to enjoy. Mm. Wonderful. That was great. <laughs> so, so when, when I hear about the, uh, the tea, uh, yeah. though, I hear about the, uh, this particular individual individual called uh, Sen no Rikyu. Uh, who is this Sen no Rikyu person? Well, Sen no, Sen no Rikyu, or sometimes we just say Sen Rikyu, he's, he's like considered the father of modern tea. And by modern tea, I mean like 500 years ago. Um, because again, tea in Japan has a long, long history. Um, but he's the one who's really given credit for making tea what it is today. Um, as I mentioned before, there was a time when there was a really big popularity in everything Chinese. And to show that you're a sophisticated person, you had to have these Chinese things. Sometimes these really expensive mei meibutsu items, these items that maybe are 200 years old, priceless, even 400, 400 years ago. Um, but with Sinriku and people that taught him, the idea of let's focus on the Japanese things more, or let's focus on everyday things more. So instead of showing everything I have, let's just focus on one or two things. Um, Sinriku was a merchant, or sorry, came from a merchant family in Sakai. Sakai is a city south of Osaka. Um, it was a big, important city. Maybe, well, it still is an important city, but at the time it was like this independent city. They had wealth, they had international connections, they had connections with um, China and gold and, well, not gold, but from weapons from other countries. So Sakai became very, very important. So what people were doing in Sakai became important to everyone because people needed to be, uh, have good relationship with the people in Sakai. Anyway, uh, Sinriki was a merchant, but then became completely dedicated to tea. Um, he became, let's say, the tea, the words to use are so weird. I'm going to say tea master, but that's not really the right word. Uh, he became like the tea connoisseur, maybe, for um, tea official, maybe, 
for some very important people in Japanese history. Uh, Oda Nobunaga, he was given credit for starting the unification of Japan. And then right after him, Hideyoshi. So Sin Sinrikyu worked for both of these men directly. And of course, he also knew um, Tokugawa, Ieyasu Tokugawa Ieyasu. So these three people, and this goes back to the end of the Sengoku period, I believe, the very begin, just before the beginning of the Tokugawa period, period um, Sinrikyu was right there next to these very important people. And so what Sinrikyu did, everyone saw. And if Hideyoshi and Nobunaga endorsed him, then everyone really paid attention. Um, he was revolutionary in a way because he really pushed what we call wabi cha, kind of a more rustic tea, kind of more of a subdued tea, not big and showy, but just kind of thoughtful. Uh, he was very influenced by Zen Buddhism and he practiced himself too. And so through his efforts, and of course, people who came before him, that connection of Zen and tea even was more solidified. Um, every, there are several different tea schools out there today. Every single one, to the best of my knowledge, traces their lineage to Sinrikyu in one way or another, through family or through his disciples. Um, he's considered, again, pretty much the father of modern tea. If you know anybody, you should know him. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I've heard of him, so wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, now I would love to ask you that, uh, I know you told me uh, Chado uh, is closely re related to uh, Zen Buddhism, but how does Chado help uh, students of uh, uh, Chado uh, hmm. to understand the deeper, uh, deeper connotation of Zen Buddhism? Yes, well, well, I, I, it's hard to say for everyone, of course, but I remember for myself personally, when I first got involved in tea or how I got involved in tea was I was in college and I was meditating a lot. I was meditating a lot by myself, but I was kind of feeling like I wasn't necessarily changing, that I was feeling like I was just validating myself. I'm by myself thinking by myself. And so of course I'm telling myself, oh, you're great. You're wonderful. You're doing it. You're awesome. But I had this feeling like mm, maybe I need to branch out more. In fact, I was at a, a dinner party with friends and there was one gentleman from Thailand and he was asking people just general questions. And he asked me, oh, so uh, what are you? And I'm like, well, um, I'm Buddhist. And he's like, oh, you Americans are all the same. You read a couple of books and you think you're Buddhist. And so I was like furious, but after a few days, I thought, well, yeah, maybe I should do something more than just sitting with my own thoughts, my own thoughts. And so I was very, very lucky that at the university I went to, uh, the University of Illinois in Champaign, they had this, and they still have this Japanese tea ceremony program. And so from there, I started to study. And so for me, Tea gave me something to do with these Buddhist ideas. You know, so if you have an idea of peacefulness, if you have an idea of insight, if you have an idea of uh, connecting with others, it's, for me, it's easier to do by doing something, to see those actions, uh, see those thoughts in action, personally. But I do have to say too, there is no real substitute for meditation. There's something about it that if that's what's needed, that's what you have to do. So channel you is not necessarily a substitute for meditation. It's a way to have, a way to allow you to put these thoughts into action. You know, so if you are trying to be tranquil, if you are trying to connect with others, if you are trying to be just beautiful in your actions, um, T helps you find a way to do that um, and put that out into the world. Um, I think it works for most people. Um, but I do have to say too, that you don't have to come towards Chana Yu in such a super serious way. You know, a, a, one person could like to go to a tea gathering because they like kimono. Another person could like to go because they like sweets. Another person could be really into Japanese history. And one guy could just be going because he wants to meet Japanese girls. That's okay, it's okay. We can all, we can all still, 
let's see, if we all follow the rules, if we all follow the, the, the framework of tea, we can all still kind of get what we want. I mean, we all don't have to think the same constantly to, to be able to communicate with each other. And so I think that's nice or an interesting lesson in tea. We're not trying to make everyone the same. We're not trying to make everyone think the same and feel the same. Just be here. If you can just be here, somehow we all get what we want, or at least what we need. So I, I think there's often, there's often lessons in tea and making tea and putting your heart to something and, and, and just seeing what happens. Wonderful. I really <laughs> appreciate your honesty. So yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you mentioned a little bit, but you know, we would love to know uh, if Chado only influences on Zen Buddhism or Chado influences on so many different kinds of things mm -hmm. in Japanese culture and uh, but you know, culture in general. So tell us. Sure, sure. I, I think that at least influences on Channel you are big and varied. You know, when I first was interested in tea, I was only interested in tea. And then I realized that, wow, to even understand this, I have to have a better understanding of Japanese culture because tea comes out of this large and complex culture. And so all these different influences come into tea. For sure, Zen is maybe one of the largest and one of the most obvious. The way we dress, the way we move, the way the rooms look. Uh, we use a lot of calligraphy, oh, a lot of calligraphy in um, uh, Channel Yu. Um, a lot of the ideas come straight from Zen. But of course, it comes from other types of Buddhism too. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly which part comes from where. But um, I have noticed that a lot of times when people think of Buddhism in Japan, they only think of Zen. You know, sometimes you'll see on Instagram that people are like, oh, this is a beautiful Zen temple. And you're like, that's a Shinto shrine, or no, that's a, that's a Nichiren temple. You know, so all these different things do come into channel you. But aside from Buddhism, um, Shintoism, Confucianism, Taoism, and even Christianity have all had their influence on Tati. Um, in, in fact, of course, we call it Chado. That Do of Chado means the way, the path. It's the exact same character we use to talk about the Tao. So already right there, there's Taoism that's influenced into uh, tea. The idea that your actions, um, or let me put it this way, in the and I try not to be too crazy about it, but like even the tea room, uh, the mats are laid out in a certain way. And there's certain directions and certain elements that we try to balance in the tea room. This idea of balancing elements, of balancing fire with water, of balancing you know, um, different things together comes directly from Taoism. The idea of, of expressing yourself and finding the way through your actions, not through all of this um, memorization of literature, but through how you express yourself and how you live in the world. I think that comes down from Taoism. Um, Shintoism, the idea of purity and cleanliness and respect and taking care of a space. I think all of this comes from uh, Shintoism too. Um, if you've ever seen people really make tea or talk about tea and handle things, we treat everything almost as if it's alive or we don't even necessarily distinguish too much between people and things. There's a spirit that's in everything and everything must be respected. Um, that's why the making of tea seems so complicated because each single thing has a different way to be touched and placed and held because there's a respect that you have to give everything. That idea of respect too, I think comes from um, Confucianism. There is a hierarchy to things. It's not just that everything's the same. There are steps and some people are in front and some people are in back. There's relationships that you should have. In, in tea, we have this big relationship between the host side and the guest side. And I, I feel that a lot of that comes from um, Confucianism. In fact, we have four principles of tea. Oh, okay, that's three. Four <laughs> principles of tea that we often think of. It's in Japanese, it's wa, ke, se, and jaku. Usually that's translated to harmony, 
respect, purity, and tranquility. Now, this is not necessarily official, these ideas I'm about to say, but I like to think that somehow you can see the different influences with harmony. Well, that's, that's uh, Taoism. Respect, maybe that's Confucianism. Um, purity, that's, time, that's kind of a Shintoism. Not that you have to be pure, is that you should always try to make things pure. And then it always go, and it goes to this kind of tranquility, this kind of, if not enlightenment, but just a satisfaction with the way things are. And it's not a satisfaction with brand new things, but sometimes it's even a satisfaction with things that have worn down a little bit. You know, something that's uh, the beautiful old farmhouse as opposed to the brand new building. And I think all these influences have come into tea and, and I know I mentioned Christianity too. Some of the movements, if you look at them and compare them to, let's say a, a Catholic mass, I think a Catholic mass or a, a Christian mass, it looks, some of it looks a lot like a communion of sharing, you know, the wine and the bread of Christ. You know, some of that looks like tea. And I don't think it's just a coincidence that that Christian influence was in Japan at about that time. Some of it was maybe taken for religious reasons. Some was just taken for aesthetic reasons. And in fact, when Christianity was banned in Japan during the Tokugawa period, there were still Japanese Christians there and they were very devout. And so they hid their religion in their tea gatherings. And so maybe under the bowl, there's a hidden cross or maybe that, that statue that's supposed to be kanon if you look really closely, like, hmm, I think that's the Virgin Mary. You know, like all these different things are there and they, they hit it in their tea gathering. And I think some of that still survives. Um, so you don't have to be any particular religion, of course, but there's these different influences have always kind of come into tea. So it just keeps changing over the years and growing. Wow, yeah. <laughs> We, I think we got the big idea. Uh, yeah, but you know, uh, we can talk about tea all day long. Yes. But we want to see the examples. I know. <laughs> sure, sure. To show us an example in a setting like this, but you know, maybe we want to see examples so that we can visualize a little bit okay. more what we're talking about here. Certainly, certainly. And, and thank you for saying that because I think it's a good, a good balance. I can talk all day about tea, but the nice thing about tea is that it's still a very, very practical thing. So when you're getting too much in your head, it's like, just be quiet and make tea. So I'll try to do that a little bit. Uh, I just need to move my camera a little bit so you can see better. Let me just move a thing or two. One moment. Okay, I'm gonna move this back. Okay, and then I'm gonna move this down a little bit. All right, maybe there. All right, if you can't see, you definitely let me know. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna show a couple of things that uh, it's just a little bit of what we do at a tea gathering. So just so you know, um, as we talked about before, kimono is probably the most appropriate thing to wear because there's certain things that you have to have. Um, all the guests, and the host all have this. Uh, the first, these are kaishi. We use this to eat our sweets from. Um, so you might be given a tray of sweets, you take them from that tray and you actually eat from your own kaishi. Everybody will bring their own. Um, you also need a kabukusa, we call that. It's a small cloth, usually very decorative, that we use to place other things on. It kind of elevate things. Um, so if you have a special utensil, maybe you don't want to put it directly on the floor, you're going to put it on this instead. And then we have the fukusa, which is the cloth that we use to actually purify the items. And I know it looks like there's a lot here, just so you know. Inside, <laughs> we have another small cloth that we use. Sometimes we have to purify a bowl when we um, drink from it. And so there's a cloth in here for that. And then sometimes you have sweets that need to be cut. So we have that in here, but I'll put most of that away. So I thought I'd just show you a little bit about the Fukusa today. 
So I did bring some things out that hopefully will help. So I'm not gonna go through like the full procedure of making tea because it really does take a while and it really should be something that you experience in person. Um, so the Fukusai I mentioned, everyone has one, but when you're making tea, you actually wear it off your obi. So let me just put that on my, my belt here. Or try to. Okay, well, um, yeah, I'll just show a little bit and hopefully that shows a little bit of the idea of what we're trying to get to, the idea of doing things beautifully with your whole heart. Um, I'm gonna purify the tea container and then the tea scoop. So to purify anything, you have to purify the fukusa first. So the folding of the fukusa actually purifies the fukus fukusa. And you're using this to remove the dust off of things. I actually find that, yes, you're removing the dust off of things, but you're also preparing your heart. It's almost as if you're taking the dust off your heart. So you don't just walk up and just make someone a bowl of tea. Built into the way of making tea is all this preparation. And so by the time you actually make the bowl, let me move that a little bit. Ah, sorry, my hands are cramping just a little bit. By the time you make the bowl of tea, your own heart is settled. Your own heart is pure. And so that you can really give your all to your guests. So I went through it kind of quickly there, <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, I had to fold the fukusa one way to purify the tea container and then fold it a different way to purify the tea scoop. Um, I'll take out the tea whisk and then take out the small cloth that I'll use to wipe the bowl with. Let's see. So I like to think that there is the purification with the fukusa, but there's also a purification with water, with hot water. So the bowl itself now will be purified. I'll just move that over here. So everything we do is also very practical by putting hot water into the bowl first, it warms the bowl up. And that way when you make tea, you're not putting hot tea in a cold bowl that's gonna drop the temperature right away. You're going to um, be able to really enjoy the tea at the proper temperature. Also the hot water gives this tea whisk a moment to soften and expand so that when you're making tea, you're not gonna break off a piece of bamboo into someone's bowl of tea, which would be pretty unfortunate you don't want to drink bamboo. So I have a little container over here of which I can pour my wastewater into. So the water is still kind of in the bowl. So I'm going to clean that up just a little bit with the small cloth. And well, I'll just whip up a quick bowl of tea since we're already here. And I think I'm getting a little thirsty anyway. So this should be for you, but I'm gonna make it for myself. Sorry about that. The guests would often have um, a sweet beforehand. So at this point, the guests would be having their sweet. Oh, and I should show you this just a little bit. Inside is the matcha. It's a green powder tea that's put into this container. And ideally we make a nice, beautiful landscape inside. I apologize, mine went a little flat today, static clean and everything went to the side. But when we're scooping out the tea, we don't just take from the middle, we try to make a beautiful scoop. Oh boy, <laughs> we try. I apologize a little bit for not having steady hands, but at the same time, that's kind of the beautiful thing too. There is, there is a way it's supposed to be. There's a way that we try to aspire to. Uh, but because of that, you can see someone's heart right away when they're making tea. You're like, oh, that person's a little nervous. Or, oh, that person's a little older. Or, oh, that person looks like they have something on their mind today. You know, so without saying a word, you can kind of read a person. You can kind of read the moment 
without even saying a word. Um, sometimes you show your heart even if you're not trying to. So I'll just quickly do that, take that off, and yeah, a little bit of a hand cramp today. I'll ex explain that again later. Um, but what happens here is that the host would give the bowl to the guest. So I'm just gonna put this to the side and I'm gonna move this out of the way. So, so I'm just gonna pretend that I'm the guest and I'm not the person who just made the tea. So the bowl will come to me with the front facing me and I'll explain that in just a second. And just for fun, I'm gonna pretend that I'm the third guest of three, or sorry, the second guest of three. There's a first guest on this side and a third guest on that side. As a guest, when I take the bowl of tea in, I first put it between myself and the first guest. And I say, oshobani itashimasu. And then I put it between myself and the next guest. And I say, osaki ni. And then I put it between myself and the, the host. And I say, otamai chodai itashimasu. What that means is, as a second guest, I'm really offering my bowl of tea to the first guest. And they say, oh, no, please go ahead and have your tea. And so I'm saying, well, in that case, I will join you. Then I move my bowl over here, and I inform the next guest, I'm so sorry for going before them, because we're really drinking and eating one person at a time. So as I'm enjoying my tea, no one else is drinking tea. And then I thank the host for going through the trouble of making the tea for me. And then <laughs> I can take the bowl up, I raise it slightly, turn it around so I'm drinking from the backside, and then I can drink. And uh, here you're probably tired of looking at my hands. <laughs> I'll explain what's going on. There we go. And here, I'm going to move closer just a little bit. All right, so everything that we have, we treat with, everything has a front and back. And so everything has to be respected accordingly. So the T-bowl and all the imp implements have a front and it faces us as we're using them. When we give them to someone else, we have to turn them around and give the front to them. When you drink from a bowl of tea, however, you don't drink from the front because, here, I'll turn it around a little bit, so this is the front and it has most of the design here. And also this is the front of the vessel. So to drink from here feels a little rude. So we turn it around and drink from the backside. And the reason I, I held it up just a little bit and bowed to the tea, it's not so much that I'm bowing to the bowl of tea, is that it's like this universal thankfulness because for me to be here right now requires the efforts of so many people. There's someone whose whole life is growing tea. There's the people who made the machines so that person can har harvest the tea. Uh, the tea had to be shipped from Japan to Chicago. There's my teacher who taught me, my parents who had to have met, um, someone who made this computer, the people who made the internet, your parents, the nation of Japan, the sky, the earth, the wind, the solar system, all of this had to happen for me to sit here to have this bowl of tea. So when I raise my bowl of tea, it's not saying thank you to the tea. It's like, thank you for everybody and everything up to this moment in time to allow me to have this moment, to have this bowl of tea. And even if we meet together every day for the rest of our lives, it's never going to be like today. So this moment is a special moment in time that can never be repeated. Um, one Zen phrase that we use a lot is Ichigo, Ichie which means one moment, one opportunity, or one meeting, perhaps. Everything you do in life only happens once. So it's easy for us to see it in a bowl of tea. It's easy to go through all of this effort, and then we can see how a bowl of tea is special. But the idea that I think that we hope happens is that you start to see that everything in your life is special. Every time you get up in the morning is a special time. Every time you eat your breakfast is a special time. Every fight you get into, every discomfort, everything is a, 
It's a special moment and you should be thankful for it. So that's why we bottle so much. And I really wanna drink this tea. <laughs> so if you give me one quick second. Thank you. <laughs> so that was just like a quick brief part of let's say what happens when you're doing a tea gathering. There's so much more to it. Um, a true tea gathering lasts maybe three and a half hours. Um, a formal tea gathering that is, that you don't make, that you do everything. Um, there's a kaiseki meal, this, this beautiful lavish meal that you have before the tea. There's what I made today, that's usucha. It's considered the thin tea, and that's the tea that most of us have. But there's also a thicker tea called koicha. And so you have koicha, you have usucha, you have all these sweets. There's the laying of the fire, there's the gathering of friends. It really, a lot goes on. And so in many ways, the tea is like the main reason that we get together, but there's all these things that we have to do. Um, so when you study tea, you kind of study everything. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for a great, great show. Uh, yes. So now we would love to know more about you. So what's going on in your world? And uh, if you have a website, as a social media, or maybe email that we can contact, uh, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Well, um, I know it sounds strange, but I really don't do much on social media. I don't have Instagram, I don't have those things, but that's okay because the important thing is not me, the important thing is tea. There's a lot of it out there. So I just, I hope people will look a little bit. There's people studying tea and performing tea and sharing tea all over the world. I'm personally a part of the Urasenke school. It's one of the three schools that traces this lineage back to Sinriku through the family. There's Urasenke, there's a Motisenke, Mushano Koji Senke. So if I, I wish that people would just look a little bit. Um, again, I'm partial to my own school, but if they look at the um, Urasenke website, which is based in Kyoto, Japan, there's tons of information there. And then from there, they actually will see all these different people studying and doing tea around the world. And in fact, I think there's also a link. I can give you that information afterwards so it can be below. But um, COVID's been really hard for everyone. As you can imagine, tea is this like people in a small space sharing a bowl of tea, sometimes drinking from the exact same bowl of tea, sharing food, um, being right next to each other. And so COVID right now has made it really difficult for us to do that. But there has been this effort to do this like virtual tea gathering. So um, there's a link I could give you that shows all these different groups around the world that are part of the Urasenke school from Canada to Mexico to all over the US and such and what we're doing right now to stay active. So yeah, don't worry about finding me, but just find someone doing tea. And if you can't find someone doing tea, just sit down and enjoy whatever you do with a little thoughtfulness. That is far more important than uh, finding me. <laughs> 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 wow, this is actually the first time who's uh, humble enough to just uh, tell me, uh, forget about my me, just to... Uh, <laughs> 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 great, great. So yes, we had a really awesome day today. Uh, if you think this information is useful, make sure to subscribe my YouTube channel follow me on Twitter and Instagram and like me on my Facebook because that's how we do it in the 21st century. So thank you very much, uh, Sensei, for coming here and talk to us about the tea. And uh, I'm sorry for, I'm not as humble as you are and uh, you know, I'm a promoter <laughs> of social media. And, uh, info. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to talk about tea. I, I hope I didn't talk all your ears off. But thank you very much. <laughs>